we have a fifth degree polynomial here, p of x, and we're asked to do several things. First, find the real roots. And let's remind ourselves what roots are. So root is the same thing as a zero, and they're the x values that make the polynomial equal to zero. So the real roots are the x values where p of x is equal to zero. So the x values that satisfy this are going to be the roots, or the zeros. And we want the real ones. As you'll learn in the future, there's also going to be imaginary roots or zeros, or there might be. And then we want to think about how many times, how many times we intercept the x-axis. Well, as we'll see, however many real roots we have, that's how many times we are going to intercept, how many, however many unique real roots we have, that's however many times we're going to intercept the x-axis. How do I know that? Well, let's just think about an arbitrary polynomial here. So those are my axes. This is the x-axis. That's my y-axis. And let me just graph an arbitrary polynomial here. So let's say it looks like that. Well, what's going on right over here? At this x value, we see, based on the graph of the function, that p of x is going to be equal to zero. So that's going to be a root. This is also going to be a root. Because at this x value, the function is equal to zero. At this x value, the function is equal to zero. At this x value, the function is equal to zero. If we're on the x-axis, then the y value is zero. So the function is going to be equal to zero. This is the graph of y is equal to y is equal to p of x. Not necessarily this p of x, but I'm just drawing some arbitrary p of x. So if there's some x value that makes the function equal to 0, well, that's going to be a point at which we are intercepting the x-axis. So we want to know how many times we're intercepting the x-axis. As we'll see, it's going to be the same number of real roots, or the same number of real zeros we have. And then they want us to figure out the smallest of those x-intercepts. And we'll figure it out for this, for this particular for this particular polynomial. So let me give myself a little bit more space. So let's get to it. So we really want to solve p of x is equal to 0. So we really want to set that right over there equal to 0 and solve this. So we want to solve this equation. The x values that make this equal to 0, if I input them into the function, I'm going to get the function equaling 0. All right. So the first thing that might jump out at you is that all of these terms are divisible by x. So I like to factor that out from the get-go. So we can rewrite this as x times x to the x to the fourth power plus 9x squared minus 2x squared minus 18 is equal to 0. Now there's something else that you might that might have jumped out of you that actually just jumped out at me as I was writing this down is that we have two we had two third degree terms and after we factored out an x now we have two second degree terms. Now it might be tempting to just add these two together and actually that it would be a completely legitimate way of trying to factor this so that we can solve this equation. But instead of instead of doing it that way, we might take this as a clue that maybe they want us to that maybe we can factor by grouping. Remember, factor by grouping, you split up that middle degree term and see if you can reverse the distributive property twice. So let's see if we can do that. Can we group together these first two terms and factor something interesting out? And group together these second two terms and factor something interesting out? And then maybe we can factor something out after that. What am I talking about? Well, this is going to be the same thing as x times, well, this one, actually, let me write a big parenthesis here. This one right over here is the same thing as, I can factor out an x squared. So it's going to be x squared plus, sorry, it's going to be x squared. If I factor out an x squared, I'm going to get an x squared plus 9. And then over here, if I factor out, a, let's see, negative 2, oh, I don't want to, if I factor out a, yep, negative 2, I'm going to get, so minus 2 times, I'm going to get an x squared plus 9 again. Now this is interesting because this is telling us maybe we can factor out an x squared plus 9. So let me factor out an x squared plus 9 from each of these terms, and I'm going to get, I am going to get x I'll leave these big green parentheses here for now. If we factor out an x squared plus 9, it's going to be x squared plus 9 times x squared, x squared minus 2. x squared minus 2. And I gave myself a little bit too much space. So let me delete that. So let me delete 
and that right over there, and then close the parentheses, and then close the parentheses. And I can, actually I can even get rid of those green parentheses now if I want to optimally make this a little bit simpler. So, so far we've been able to factor it as x times x squared plus 9 times x squared minus 2. And the whole point that I'm factoring this is if I can find a, a product of a bunch of expressions equaling 0, then I can say, well, the product of those expressions are going to be 0 if one or more of those expressions are equal to 0, and I can solve for x. Well, let's see, this one's completely factored. If we're, this one is completely factored if we're thinking about real roots. This one, you can view it as a difference of squares if you view, as, if you view 2 as the square root of 2 squared. So we can rewrite this as, and of course all of this is equal to 0. Let me just write equals, equals. So we could write this as equal to x times, times x squared plus 9 times, let's see, I can factor this business into x plus the square root of 2 times x minus the square root of 2. I'm just recognizing this as a difference of squares. And once again, we just want to solve this whole, all of this business equaling 0. All of this equaling 0. So how can this equal 0? Well, any one of these expressions, if I take the product, and if any one of them equals 0, then I'm going to get 0. So x could be equal to 0. x could be equal to 0. And that actually gives us a root. When x is equal to 0, this polynomial is equal to 0. And that's pretty easy to verify. Let's see, can x squared plus 9 equal 0? x squared plus 9 equals 0. Well, if you subtract 9 from both sides, you get x squared is equal to negative 9. And that's why I said there's no real solution to this. So no real, let me write that, no real solution. There, is, there are some imaginary solutions, but no real solutions. Now, can x plus the square root of 2 equal 0? x plus the square root of 2 equals 0. Sure, if we subtract square root of 2 from both sides, you get x is equal to the negative square root of 2. And can x minus the square root of 2 equals 0? Sure, you add square root of 2 to both sides, you get x is equal to the square root of 2. So there we have it. We have figured out our zeros. x could be equal to 0. p of 0 is 0. p of negative square root of 2 is 0. And p of square root of 2 is equal to 0. So those are our zeros. X is, their zeros are at 0, negative squares of 2, and positive squares of 2. And so those are going to be the three times that we intercept the x-axis. And what is the smallest of those intercepts? Well, the smallest number here is negative square root, negative square root of 2. And you could tackle it the other way. You could, you, could, you could take this part right over, which part? Yeah, this part right over here, and you could add those two middle terms and then factor in a non-grouping way, and I encourage you to do that. But just to see that this makes sense, that the zeros really are the x-intercepts, uh, I went to Wolfram Alpha and I graphed this, this polynomial, and this is what I got. So this is what I got right over here. So whenever, if you see a fifth degree polynomial, you'll say, well, it, it might, it'll have as many as five real zeros, but if it has some imaginary zeros, it won't have five real zeros. Instead, this one has three. And that's because the imaginary zeros, which we'll talk more about in the future, they come in these conjugate pairs. So you, if you don't have five real roots, the next possibility is that you're going to have three real roots. And if you don't have three real roots, the next possibility is you're going to have one real root. So that's an interesting thing to think about. And so here you see your three, your three real roots, you see your three real roots, which correspond to the x values at which the function is equal to 0, which is where we have our x-intercepts.